Okay, welcome to uh, class three of our CSE 104. We're going to try to finish the whole seminar in, in 104. We left off talking about uh, what might have happened during the flood uh, in the days of Noah, how that moving water automatically separates particles uh, by density. And we talked about uh, underwater landslides called turbidity currents or runouts, and it's incredible how far they can go with those things. Um, Moving water will separate things automatically based upon numerous different factors, based upon the animal's body density, um, uh, complexity of the body shape, and things like that. All over the world, dinosaur bones are found. This is a real dinosaur bone right here, a toe bone, uh, the second bone back in your toe. Yeah, bring them both up here, Eric. That'd be great. Okay. Fossils are found literally all over the world. It's just unbelievable how many dead animals there are still buried in the rock. Here's an ammonite, uh, a good size one. We'll have a small one here in a minute. And a stalactite. Been wanting to get that out here anyway. Yeah, that's good right there. In uh, Vernal, Utah, not too far from the Colorado border, you can find Vernal, V-E-R-N-A-L on your map. There's a fossil graveyard. It's just incredible. A giant hill the more they dig into the hill, the more dinosaur bones they find. I mean, tons and tons and tons of dinosaur bones all packed in. They call it a fossil graveyard. Those are extremely common, believe it or not. They're found dozens, if not hundreds of places around the world. You find fossil graveyards. This one, I want you to notice the backbone of the creature. Um, there's no head, no tail, no limbs, no arms, uh, and no teeth marks. This creature rotted. He didn't... Uh, it didn't, wasn't scavenged, wasn't torn apart by predators. In Wyoming, in 1934, they discovered uh, a famous dinosaur discover on a ranch owned by Howard uh, Baker Howe, um, lived at the foot of Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. The concentration of fossils was remarkable. They were like, piled like logs in a jam. And that is very frequently the way dinosaur bones are found, or fossils, period, are found, just packed into an area. There's a uh, monument in Texas, after they... Uh, Texans lost at the Alamo. Actually, you know, if you lose 110 men and you kill about 1,000 of the enemy, I think you win, but <laughs> they lost, okay? Um, they lost at the Alamo. Santa Ana's army went uh, marching across Texas, and the, the big Texas army caught them and defeated them very badly at the Battle of San Jacinto. There's a huge monument built there. If you ever go to Houston area, outside of Houston is the San Jacinto Monument. Go up and look at it real close. The entire monument is made out of huge blocks of stone. All of them are solid fossils. It's just giant blocks of stone the size of this desk cut and smoothed out and put together to build this giant monument out of all fossil material like this. Millions, probably billions of fossils in that thing. In Belgium, back in 1878, remarkable concentration of iguanodon skeletons. Now, the iguanodon... Uh, Eric, you'll need to know about this one. This was the first dinosaur found and put together. This was the one in 1809, before the word dinosaur was even made up. The first dinosaur reassembled in modern times was the iguanodon. It got the name because when they got the teeth, the dentist or the doctor who looked at these giant teeth that his wife had found, actually, he was in working on a patient, I think, and his wife is out there waiting in the buggy and noticed some guys were digging a ditch to put in a drainage pipe or something, and they were digging through some fossils. She said, what are these? They said, we don't know. We find these things once in a while. Huge fossilized teeth. And they were, she, the, her husband, who's a doctor, said, well, these look exactly like the teeth of an iguana. So that's where the word iguanodon comes from. Orthodontist works on your teeth, you know. Uh, so they, the first one ever put together. Now, they put it together uh, seriously wrong. Okay, they made a lot of mistakes when they reassembled it. If you handed you a package of bones and said, here, put it together, well, <laughs> the chances of getting it right... They blew it. But uh, regardless, this was the first one. But they found so many iguanodon skeletons in this Belgian coal mine. It was 1,000 feet below ground, and they're digging through and found uh, all these iguanodon skeletons. Remarkable part of it was they were extending through 100 feet of solid rock. So the deeper you dig, the more iguanodon skeletons you find for 100 feet. This fellow says, much to my surprise, the book documents literally hundreds, not just a handful, of well-exposed dinosaur track sites spread all over the world. These are dinosaur footprints. Uh, Eric, did you go to uh, Dinosaur Valley State Park? Have you been to Texas? When you guys go to uh, um, Texas in two weeks, oh, you're not going. That's right. I don't know if it's too far to drive, I think, for that one. 
if you get to Dallas area, it's about 50 miles southwest of Dallas, there are about, I'm going to say, several hundred dinosaur footprints in the rock. If you get to Holyoke, Massachusetts, which is right just about dead center of Massachusetts, there's quite a few dinosaur mm -hmm. footprints. You can, there's a little sign about yay big, dinosaur tracks, you're driving down the highway, and you stop, and you walk down in the valley, and there's dinosaur footprints all over in the solid rock. Um, they find them in Connecticut. Literally, I would say hundreds of places around the world, dinosaur footprints are found in the rock. This fellow says, in, uh, continuing here, uh, tracks, trackways, nests, eggs, and corpulites, that's petrified dinosaur doo-doo, of the reptilian masters of the Mesozoic and are chronicled from all over the world. And the record is an impressive one, indeed in terms not only of abundance and geographic distribution, but also quality of preservation. Lockley and Gilbert report more than 400 dinosaur track sites in North and South America alone. And they especially note 12 large localities around the world that contain more than 1,000 individual tracks and or more than 100 different trackways. Now, a trackway is a series of tracks in a row, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. More than 100 tracks in a row in a trackway. Robert Bloom, South African paleontologist, estimated there are 800,000 million skeletons of vertebrate animals, animals with backbones, of vertebrate, in the Karoo Formation. This is in Africa. Just based on how many bones they find, they said, well, there's probably, we know how big this area is where we find these bones, there's probably 800,000 million. That's 800 billion animals. Now, the skeptics have said, if each of these animals was the average size of a fox, uh, the world would not be big enough to handle this many animals. You couldn't feed them. That's, skeptics use the Karoo Formation as evidence uh, against creation. They'll say, see, there's too many people, too many animals there, they couldn't all live in one place. Well, now that's silly. They, first of all, the, the numbers, anytime somebody says, you know, like Noah couldn't get all the animals on the ark, or all the animals couldn't survive to make the fossils we have in the Karoo Formation, they always start with the assumption using today's Earth's surface area. Keep in mind, today's Earth is 70% underwater. All right? That's not the way it was before the flood. Now it turns this way. So they will start off and say, oh, you know, this is ice caps and this is uh, desert and tundra. There's only about X number acres of livable land and 800 billion animals on those many acres. Uh, see, they'd be piled this deep. <laughs> yeah, look at the numbers you're multiplying is your problem, okay? They're using uh, today's livable land surface. Uh, if the earth was totally habitable, which I suspect it was, since the Bible says there were green herb over all the earth, Genesis 1 30 for the animals to eat the green herb, which is over all the earth, probably uh, totally habitable. Never mentions oceans, uh, just says there were seas. The waters were gathered together into one place. I don't think we have any way to tell what the earth used to be like before the flood. How much was land, how much was water, we'll find out when we get to heaven. Uh, question. Sure. Wouldn't the footprints themselves be evidence of some kind of cat catastrophic event? Because people make footprints in the mud all the time. And the footprints in the mud disappear. Right, they don't, they're not preserved. The, the only way, the, not only footprints, but extremely delicate creatures are found fossilized. Jellyfish, yeah. sa uh, sand dollars, um, ammonites. This is a little creature. It rolls up, similar to a, a, a squid, but it's got a hard body. It can stra Sometimes they're found straight, fossilized, but generally they're found curled up. And they get pretty big ones, like this one here. Uh, I saw one that came from Texas. Of course, everything's bigger in Texas. But it, was, uh, it would barely fit in the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, remember we got our picture by that one, didn't we? That giant ammonite. Um, remember in South Dakota, we were up there and found all the fossil shark's teeth out there looking in the field, you know, about 500 of them in 30 minutes, little tiny shark's teeth. Uh, there's quite a few of them on the shelf over here in the museum we're getting started. But, uh, so what's the evolution? Well, delicate animals, delicate creatures, in order for them, fossilized worms are found. Uh, here's a fossilized fish found in diatomaceous earth. Um, the diatomaceous earth, of course, is the, the powdery stuff we showed you in the last class. It, it is excellent for preserving fossils. I mean, extreme detail is found preserved. You can see the little tiny ribs on the fish, the fins, uh, the little scales. Here, why don't you pass that around, Daniel? It's, it's already been broken once. Treat, treat that carefully, if you would. You can see the, uh, the detail found in that little thing. And those are extremely common. I mean, like trillions of them are found in certain places. It's un unbelievable. You sp I, there's probably two more inside that if we could split the shale open 
or split the diatomaceous soil, probably some more inside. But it, it would just crumble, you know, you'd lose it. Um, the evolutionists, I've never heard them talk much about that, but to the creationists, it's very simple. During the flood, you would have some areas of enormous uh, uh, confusion and uh, the, this earth being destroyed. Other areas would be pretty tranquil, just the mud flows in. Just if the o ocean was extremely muddy, just the dirt mud settling out would be perfect to fossilize creatures like that. For one thing, many of these fish that are found fossilized, all of the fins on their back are extended. They were scared stiff of something. This was a, something different was happening they'd never seen happen before. Something new, and they were terrified, and they died in, uh, in positions of terror. Their gills would plug up very quickly if the oceans were muddy. And, of course, this would not be every square inch of the earth. I mean, right now, there's probably a storm going on somewhere, but it doesn't affect us here, right? So one atheist said, well, if it was turbulent water every place, how did any fish survive? Well, duh, okay, it wasn't turbulent water every place. <laughs> just Probably uh, certain areas would be, especially along the splits where the uh, ocean floor would split open with the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or the uh, San Andreas Fault in California. Those areas, probably within a few hundred miles of those areas, would be extremely turbulent and everything would die. But there'd be other areas where it wasn't that, wasn't that way. You only got to get two fish to survive someplace on the earth. Up in Canada, this is uh, Canadian National Geographic, shows the uh, a 90, fall 99 edition uh, from Creation Illustrated is where the picture came from, but it uh, shows a petrified, not, not even petrified, sometimes just preserved, fossil, or fossilized, preserved redwood tree stumps. Huge redwood trees were growing on Axel Island. Now, Axel Island is real close to the North Pole. Redwood trees don't grow very many places in the world. Okay, I think California and maybe southern Oregon is the only place where they grow, where they're found still alive, native. Remember, we went out there and we drove all the way through the redwood forest and stopped and saw those enormous trees. You can't imagine not only how, how huge the trees are, but how close they are together. When you guys were there, did you see them? In a room this size, there would be four of them growing. <laughs> and they're each nine-foot diameter. You know? Here they are, Axel Island, you can see on the map there, uh, is about as far north in Canada as you can get. And there on Axel Island, there are petrified trees. Well, if you go to Axel Island today, there are no trees. There is nothing. Just barren landscape. Lots of nothing. See, these things had to be buried and preserved very quickly. And petrification can happen very rapidly. There are scores of examples we can give you of how quickly things can petrify in less than 100 years. This is a piece of petrified uh, wood. Actually, this is probably some type of reed... Uh, the textbooks often show dinosaurs, or you know, the kids' dinosaur books will show them around these huge ferns, massive ferns. This is uh, pretty heavy. I'll let you pass that around and look at it. Uh, if you want to grab that, Daniel. There's no, uh, no real ring structure to it, to this reed, but you can see on the surface that this, is, this thing has been slightly flattened. Notice it's wider than one direction. This thing would have been squeezed... Uh, like asparagus, sort of like a giant asparagus, basically, is what that would be, something similar to that. So it's squeezed in one dimension, one direction, flattened out, holds whole huge areas of this, and then fossilized in the oval shape. Here's a petrified mammoth tooth. Now, usually, when they dig up mammoth teeth, or any fossilized bones, for that matter, very frequently, exposure to the oxygen starts the crumbling process. They begin to decay. Do we have that white one... Um, that's half decayed. Check behind the screen there, if you would, Eric. You know what I'm talking about, the mammoth tooth where it's half gone? I don't know if we brought that out yet. We're just setting up our museum. This, uh, oh yeah, there we go. This is one that was not coated to protect it uh, in time, and so it began to crumble and uh, began to decay. So this was another, this is another mammoth tooth. There's quite a few uh, shells and rocks and different various assorted things stuck to it from the, it's called the matrix, the rock that it was in. Here, I'm going to pass those around. That's a real mammoth, piece of a mammoth tooth, and here's the other one, the whole one. We also have a baby mammoth tooth there, if you can grab that, son. Uh, here's on the screen is a petrified water wheel. No, it's on a little wooden stand, a little wooden block, and it's kind of stuck to it. Right. This is about half, then, of a baby mammoth tooth. 
and it was coated with a varnish right away so it wouldn't uh, crumble from oxygen getting to it. Uh, that's a gastric stone. Some dinosaurs would eat rocks in order to chew up their food, like chickens do, you know, like a crop. Dinosaurs <coughs> did that. And those are often real smooth, rounded off stones. Uh, no, that's not out here yet. Uh, here on the screen, if you can see that, is a piece of petrified wood. Uh, this is a piece of petrified wood I'm holding in my hand. Let me explain the process of how it works. You can see one side's been cut and polished, and you can see the grain pattern, just like you know, a piece of wood you'd make furniture out of. Um, I believe this is palm wood. If I, no, this has got a grain to it. I don't remember. The guy who gave it to me, I, I put a label on it. It's someplace on the shelf. I'll have to get that, what type of wood it is. But basically, if you look at a piece of wood under the magnifying, under a microscope, each fiber of wood is made of millions of wood cells end to end, which uh, plant cells have a hard shell, out, hard outer uh, cell coating, and then the membrane inside. Animal cells only have a membrane, and the uh, plant cells have a cell wall. Well, when it dies, the inside is going to rot and disappear. The fluid's going to drain out, leaving behind, like a piece of wood, when they dry it out, is, um, there's a piece of wood here. The fibers in the piece of wood, if you look at it under a magnifying glass or a microscope, are actually like long tubes because the ends fall out. and So this soaks minerals into it. Whatever you bury the wood in, uh, that's, it's going to absorb those particular minerals. If it's buried in uh, iron-rich water or mud, uh, it may try to take an iron texture to it. I've got petrified wood around here. I've got all kinds of petrified wood. I should have got some of that out on the shelf, but I just got one piece. This is a piece of petrified wood, though, that's been chopped on. There are chop marks. Somebody was chopping this with a hatchet. I would assume before it petrified. <laughs> and here it is, a piece of petrified firewood. Glenn French up in uh, New York called me and said, Brother Hovind, I watched your seminar tapes, and he said, uh, I have a pile of firewood in my backyard or was, I think it was in his backyard, near his home. He said it was cut in the 1930s. You can still see the chainsaw marks, and it's all petrified. I think one of his neighbors had it, because when I called him a few months ago to say, man, I want a piece of that. We got, finally got our museum available you know, to put stuff in. He said, oh, it's all gone. Petrified firewood. I held a piece in my hand, though. A guy gave me a piece of petrified wood. and said, Red Hovind, what is this? I said, that's petrified wood. He said, look at it close. Still petrified wood. He said, look at the ends of it. And when I looked at the end of it, you could see it had been chopped with a hatchet. You could see the chop marks from the axe on a piece of solid petrified wood. I held it in my hand. I offered to buy it off me. He wouldn't sell it. I don't know where it is now. Here's a, um, this, I found out just yesterday, this is actually mummified, not petrified. A mummified dog in a tree. They brought this big log to a sawmill in Georgia, uh, in Rome, Georgia, American Forests Magazine, carried the article. I, if you can find me the original article, I'd love to get a picture of it. All I know is it's one of the past issues. I have no idea even what year. And it's on page 64. So if anybody watching this tape can get a hold of the American Forest magazine, please send it to me. Uh, David Royal from Rome, Georgia took the photo and I called and there's about 19 David Royals in Georgia and I've called almost all of them. And it ain't none of them that I've talked to so far, so I'd love to meet them. But they're bringing this huge log, truckload of logs to the sawmill to cut it up for wood. Inside one of them was a mummified dog. Apparently had chased a coon up the tree and got stuck. That's the best, best thing we can figure out. Uh, he's still there. But uh, the, I just found out Marlissa chased it down yesterday. The dog, the, the log and the dog are in a, uh, Georgia. in Georgia someplace. It's at a, not a museum, but it's, it hasn't been destroyed yet. I'd love to buy it for our museum here. Here's a petrified fish giving birth, fossilized in the act of giving birth. Now, these are, believe it or not, an extremely common fossil. Thousands of these have been found. There's a couple of theories of what, what caused this. Some say the fish was pregnant and within a, within a certain time period, a few weeks or months of giving birth, and just the pressure squeezed the baby out after it died just the pressure of all the rock and mud and sand and gravel or whatever. 
or it might have actually been fossilized, you know, in the process of giving birth. This would have to be buried quickly, obviously. It doesn't take millions of years to give birth. And then fossilized in such incredible detail. I mean, you can see, you could see almost hair-like structures fossilized. So petrification takes uh, very little time, actually. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's leg still in it. This was taken to the boot manufacturer. Let me just read you the details on this. Petrified cowboy leg. You can see the picture of it. Uh, I've got it in my suitcase. I carry it around with me, one of the posters I put out. You don't have one of those, do you? you got a picture of it. A picture of it. Yeah, I don't have the cowboy boot. I'd love to get it. <laughs> uh, Bible.ca, for Canada, slash tracks, T-R-A-C-K-S. Now, there are several things about Bible doctrine I disagree with this, this website on. Okay, we could argue on what they teach, you know, I think their Bible doctrine is off in a few areas, but still, they got fascinating stuff on uh, things petrifying. Petrified cowboy leg found in Dry Creek Bed near West Texas town of Iran about 1980 by Mr. Jerry Stone, employee of Corvette Oil Company. The bones of the partial leg and foot within the boot were revealed by an elaborate set of CT scans, CAT scans, performed at Harris Methodist Hospital in Bedford, Texas, July 1997. The radiologic technician was uh, Evelyn Americas, AART, American Association of Radiological Technicians. A complete set of these scans remains with the boot at the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. Carl Ball has it. The company that, they, they found out the company that made the boot. And they said, oh yeah, we use this stitching pattern, and they're looking at this boot, you know, in the 1950 to 53, somewhere in that range. So who knows the story behind it? Cowboy's leg got torn off or shot off or something. Or he's uh, um, Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, this is part of him they found in Texas and part of him is in New York. and <laughs> Whatever. Um, about uh, a couple of months ago, I guess last year, a guy sent me a picture. He said, Mr. Owen, some friends of mine, uh, their daughter, Katie Crane, a high school student, dug up this hammer in their yard a few weeks ago. Don't know how long it was buried, but the houses on their lot are less than 40 years old. The area was used as a marine camp during World War II. It appears that the handle has petrified in this time. It is a hollow handle with a steel pin running up the, to the head. If you're interested in a higher resolution picture, let me know. Aloha. This was found in, in the Hawaii. Here's a petrified hat found in uh, New Zealand. This is a felt hat. You know, like, um, I don't think we have any felt hats around here. Cowboy hats. Cowboy hats are felt felt hats, you know, which is actually pressed wool. This is a fossilized crayon. I brought it in so you can see it. Missionary to Arizona. Um, this in Sanders, Arizona. Missionary family, uh, the Wilsons. Randall Wilson sent me this petrified crayon. I mean, it is a rock. And you can see it's very obviously a crayon. Some kid was writing with it. The end of it's flattened out like, the, pass that around, Daniel. Everybody can see the petrified crayon. He said, I have sent this fossilized crayon to hopefully help you. I found it in Sanders, Arizona. This is in northeast Arizona. We live in a very dry climate. I found it in a fossilized area. Your friend, Randall. So there you go, a piece of fossilized crayon. Try to scratch it. I mean, it's, or better yet, try to write with it. <laughs> Turn to stone. Um, I talked to Robert Brazil in uh, Wisconsin who has a petrified pin cushion. Pin cushion with several pins in it. The thing has turned to stone. They sent me some pictures of it. The pictures were just not, you couldn't tell what it was from the pictures. He said it's one of those things you got to hold it in your hand. Interesting story here. Um, in Tennessee, back in 1883, 1881, a doctor died, and so they buried him. A good thing to do. Um, Fourteen years later, Grandma died. They're going to bury her. When they dug the hole next to Grandpa, water soaked into the hole. And they said, oh, we don't want to bury her where there's water. So they moved on the other side and dug a hole. Water soaked in. So they buried Grandma somewhere else. The grandkids got worried about Grandpa being buried in the water, and so they dug him up. He'd been in the ground for 14 years. Here's the story. Uh, let's see. The most intriguing of these clay replica, this is at a museum, a walk-through tour they have there at this uh, place in Tennessee. 
a clay replica of the petrified man. An article published in 1897 issue of Upper Cumberland News tells how this amazing discovery was made. According to the article, a prominent uh, resident of the town, Dr. William Davidson, had died and was buried some 14 years prior to the death and burial of his wife, Minerva. When her grave was dug beside his, it was discovered that a stream of water had entered the first grave, passed through the coffin from head to foot and on out. The occupant of the coffin had been turned to stone, presumably as a result of the continual flow of water and perhaps the minerals in it over such a long period of time. The wife was buried in another location and the husband's body was removed from its watery grave and reburied beside her. A descendant of the petrified man will be at the museum to talk with visitors as they view the sculpture which has created, was created by Gainsborough artist Mary Larson and one of her students, Joseph West. I read more on this. Um, let's see if I have the article here in front of me. The arms had rotted off, but the rest of the body had petrified in 14 years. 1960, uh, uh, this is an interesting story here. A 62-year-old widow in Sao Paulo, Brazil, didn't have the faintest idea what was causing the pain on the right side of her stomach. So she went to the doctor's office, where x-rays revealed quite a surprise, a perfectly formed petrified skeleton of a fetus inside of her. Petrified baby's skeleton, 20 inches long. There's the story. I hear. It's an extremely rare case. Uh, duh. To the do Dr. Jose, whatever, chief obstetrician at the hospital in uh, this place, however you pronounce that, in Sao Paulo, 1,700 miles from Sao Paulo. The fetus had been inside her body for near the intestines for at least 15 years, which was when she said was the last time she had sexual relations, Mr. Nito said by phone. I was shocked when I was told I had been pregnant for so long because during all this time my belly never swelled. The widow, Antonetta Hilario, told the whatever, newspaper in, uh, on Wednesday. The doctor uh, did not know exactly how old the 20-inch long fetus was when it died, nor its sex. We should be able to determine these things when we remove the fetus surgically. It does appear, however, that the baby was about to be born when it died inside its mother's body. No date has been set for surgery. Petrified fetus inside the mother. Website uh, www.s-t.com slash daily slash 0496 04-96 slash 04-05 slash 96 slash Z people uh, HTM. <laughs> Don't know. Strange things found out there. 20 inches long and you didn't know you were pregnant? I've seen some pretty big Mexican women that might... Uh, <laughs> seen some big American women too that wouldn't know, you know, uh, so uh, who knows. Um, Students are being taught now that each layer of the rock is a different age, the geologic column, which doesn't exist anywhere in the world, okay? And they're taught that the fossils tell you which era it's from. If you find reptiles, this is the age of reptiles. Or if it's in fish, this is the fish age, you know, or the chalk age, Cre Cretacea. That's what all these words are, uh, Cretaceous and all that kind of stuff. The layers, first of all, the fossils are not well sorted like the textbook teaches. By the time it ends up in your textbook, it, they show, you know, all the dinosaurs in one layer. Well, that's just flat, not the way it is, okay? But even if it were, that wouldn't prove anything. Um, this uh, David Ropp, who's a curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, a strong believer in evolution, by the way, Ropp says, one of the ironies of the creation-evolution debate is that the creationists have accepted the mistaken notion that the fossils record shows a detailed and orderly progression. Here's an evolutionist admitting the fossil record does not show an orderly progression from simple to complex. So what the, some creationists have done, they have said, well, the fossil record is simple on the bottom and complex on the top, and we can explain how it happened. I think we can explain how it happened, and I will in a moment. But it's, his, he's saying they're not always found that way. Sometimes the complex are on the bottom. And if the fossils are out of order, According to the evolutionary thinking, they've got a whole list of things they can call on to explain why they're out of order. Uh, a reversal. A huge section of land the size of you know, Washington State flipped over. Oh, yeah, that happens all the time, you know. <laughs> For instance, the Matterhorn, the famous mountain in Switzerland, you know, that goes up like this and then it comes out and then goes back up. Makes it really tough to climb. Um, the Matterhorn uh, is, is reversed where the uh, older layers are on top. 
of the younger layers. Chief Mountain, Montana, same way. What they say are the oldest layers are on top of the youngest layers. I wonder how did that happen? Of course, the evolutionist, uh, undaunted, will say, well, there was an overthrust. You see, you got the oldest at the bottom and the youngest on top. Okay. And then uh, the section of land broke and it slid up over the top. So we ended up with the oldest on top of the youngest. It's called an overthrust. Trouble is, this overthrust is like, I don't forget how many thousand square miles. You know, don't you think if, if a few thousand square miles of the crust of the earth was sliding over the other part, don't you think you'd be able to see some, uh, rubbing. some rubbing in between? <laughs> yeah. It would break up, obviously. The, the friction would be enormous, okay? And it would create a, a section of rock called breca, just s s crunched rock, you know? Slide a chunk of concrete over another chunk of concrete. Just drag it with a tractor just a few feet and see what happens, okay? And here this thing supposedly slid like 100 miles and left no evidence. This is just flat dreaming. But the name and age of the layer is determined by the fossils it contains. This fellow, Niles Eldridge, who also believes in evolution, said, this poses something of a problem. If we date the rocks by the fossils, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time in the fossils. See, the rocks are dated by the fossils, and the fossils, of course, are dated by the rock layers. We've been through that before, and that's simply uh, silly. Okay. Moving water will automatically separate particles based upon their density, based upon a lot of different factors. The textbooks often say clams are found at the bottom of the so-called geologic column because clams evolved first. And birds are found at the top, and they say, see, that's proof birds evolved last. Well, uh, duh, there might be another explanation for this. Maybe clams are found at the bottom because they're already at the bottom when the flood, flood starts. Wouldn't they be the first ones buried? They're sorted based on their habitat. You know, maybe birds are found on top of the geologic column because birds are the last ones to drown in a flood. Right? Fly around until you run out of gas. Maybe they're sorted based upon their intelligence. As far as we can figure out, you know, clams aren't too bright. Maybe they're sorted based upon their mobility. Clams can't run very fast. Maybe they're sorted based upon their body density. You know, clam shells are a little heavier than bird feathers. So the sorting, that w there is a little bit of sorting, but it's not necessarily due to evolution. You know, how fast uh, was that calf going? Anyway, there might be two ways to look at this. Okay, if you find all the reptiles in one layer, that doesn't lead you to conclude that all the reptiles evolved at the same time you might conclude that reptiles have a similar body density so they get buried in a flood in the same layers with the liquefaction phenomena. Let's take a little break. When we come back, we're going to talk about liquefaction. This is a fascinating uh, thing that to discuss, and Walt Brown has a great section on this in his book, um, uh, In the Beginning, which is, I highly recommend that book. So we'll talk about that when we get back after the break. Continue now talking about uh, what would happen during the flood. Liquefaction is an interesting process. If you go out to the beach, uh, walk out into the surf where the water is about two or three feet deep, and just stand there. Don't move a muscle. You notice a very interesting phenomena will happen over about the next ten minutes. The, as the wave comes in, the high part of the wave obviously is heavier than the low part of the wave. There's more water there. So the high part of the wave will exert more pressure, squeezing water down into the sand underneath. Then, as the low part comes by, the pressure is relieved, and the water begins to squirt up out of the sand. Water is not real compressible, um, neither is sand, but there's enough compression there between the difference of the weights of the water that there's a pressing and a releasing of the pressure on the sand every time a wave goes by. If you just stand there, don't move a muscle, sand grains will come hopping up off the bottom and land on top of your feet. Ten minutes later, you're ankle deep, covered up in sand, and you have not moved. That process is called liquefaction. The liquefaction takes place by the pressing and the relieving of the pressure. Okay. During the flood, if the earth were totally covered by water, totally covered, liquefaction would be enormous. 
because not only do you have relatively soft sediments that are just settling out, they haven't turned to stone yet. You know, you'd have thousands of feet of sediment all over the world. Um, you'd also have a tidal change. See, the moon is pulling on the, on the earth, and this creates a bulge in the earth called the tide, the high tide. The problem is the tide just gets going, and all of a sudden it runs into something. America, Africa, Asia, or something, okay? It runs into some land, and this messes everything up. That's why the Gulf of Mexico does not have real good tidal change. Anybody know what it is? Is it about a half a foot? Total swing, two feet. Okay. I was up and uh, preached at a church, and Eric, you were up there at the Bay of Fundy in uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. Just the way it works, if you had a pan of water, and I want you to tip it up and pour it toward one corner, as the water, you might only lift it up a half inch, but as the water goes rushing toward that one corner, it comes up five inches. It's all focused in that one spot. Um, the... Bay of Fundy works like that. Just it happens to be in the right spot, and so does Anchorage, Alaska. The, the channel is just right where all of a sudden the tide rushes into that one place. And in the Bay of Fundy, the, water, the greatest tidal change they've ever had is 103 feet. Low tide to high tide, 103 foot difference. That was during what's called spring tide, uh, where the moon and the sun line up. If the moon is pulling on the earth and the sun is canceling out part of it, 90 degrees, it, it's not as high. That's called neap tide. Who cares? Okay. Um, I think Bay of Fundy averages about a 50-foot tidal change. I mean, every six and a half hours or whatever their, whatever their cycle is. It would be every six hours and 25 minutes regularly if it weren't for the fact that the earth's surface has all these continents in the way to mess up things. If it was just all water, the tides would be get into a rhythm and it would go every six hours and 25 minutes, high tide, then low tide. See, the earth turns uh, once a day. Oh, this way. So it would be every six hours. You'd have a high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, high tide. So it would be just real nice every six hours. You could tell, you know, when the high tide was going to be or low tide. The problem is, while the earth is turning, the moon is also moving. That's why you get the six hours and 25 minutes, because during that six hours, it has moved 25 minutes worth. Now, who cares? Okay, <laughs> well, the, uh, if the Earth were liquid, covered, without any continents to stop the tides, they would quickly become harmonic. If you know in music, how uh, you can pluck one string and it makes other strings vibrate. That's called, uh, they, 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 the harmonics is, certain strings sound good together. You know, uh, C, E, and F sound good together. C major chord. Other strings don't sound good together. They don't vibrate well together. Uh, those are the ones that I play. The uh, harmonics of the tide would be, you would have about a 200-foot tidal change if the earth were simply covered with water. The reason we only get a 2-foot tidal change in the Gulf of Mexico and a 100-foot tidal change in Bay of Fundy is because of the shape of the earth's surface. So if you smooth it all out, which you'd have during the flood, liquid-covered earth, even then, though some places are deeper than other, the Bible says the water was, you know, 15 cubits. We assume that to be about 22 feet above the tallest mountain. It's interesting. The ark was 30 cubits high. And that's half the draft of the ark. The draft is called how much, you know, goes underwater of a boat. You take an aircraft carrier, you know, it might be 150 feet up out of the water and only how much in the water? One third? Yeah, one third of it's underwater. That's the draft. So it was safe where you could not drag bottom anywhere as long as you're in, in the ark. You couldn't hit a mountain. So you get a 200 foot tidal change, you get an enormous liquefaction problem. This is going to squeeze and release the pressure and squeeze and release the pressure every six and a half hours for. Well, Noah was in the ark for 13 months. We can assume the earth was probably covered with water f continuously for at least a few of those months. It may have taken six months to kill everybody. You know, they probably found a way to escape or build a homemade raft real quick. But, you know, after a few months, you run out of food. Other factors begin to enter in and you start to die off. Um, so I suspect it probably took six months to kill everybody during the flood. And then it took another several months for the water to go down. 
and for the continent to become stabilized, and we'll get into more of that later. Here's Walt Brown's book in the beginning showing us some sand. What happens during liquefaction? A plume. You have a layer of sand, and then more lock, rock gets layered on top. And all of a sudden, the pressure exerts, squirts the sand up through one place, and you get a massive sand plume, sometimes as big as Pensacola. The rest of the rock's going to erode away, leaving behind this sand plume like Ayers Rock in uh, uh, Australia, which is probably a sand plume. You know, that huge red rock out in the middle of the desert. It's a big thing sticking up. Uh, he thinks that's a, probably a sand plume from the flood. I think he's probably right. Okay, Genesis chapter 7. The Bible says, The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Now, Hugh Ross tells people it's just a local flood in the days of Noah. If all the high hills are covered, that's not a local flood. Right? Looks to me like a worldwide flood. The Bible says, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. This is not a local flood. This is a worldwide flood. So where did all that water go? Well, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, it says, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. That word assuaged is a very interesting Old English word. We don't use it much anymore, but it means to sink down. The water did not run off. The water assuaged. This is different. In the, the New International Version, NIV, they say, But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals. Now, that's, they added that. Okay, There's no place the Bible says they were wild. Quite the opposite, actually. The Bible teaches they were not afraid of man until after the flood. But see, they, in order to get a copyright in a, on, a, on a book, you have to make a certain percentage, a certain number of changes or they won't give you a copyright because you're basically writing the same book. So that's why they added all sorts of things and took all sorts, just to make it different so they could get a copyright on it. So the King James, of course, is not copyrighted. Um, so they were not wild animals because this conflicts with other scripture, which says, you know, they were not uh, afraid of man until after uh, the flood was over, Genesis chapter 9. We'll get to that later on. Okay. Then it says here in the NIV, the waters receded. Now, this is a mistake. The water did not recede. The water sank down. It dropped straight down. If we filled this building five feet deep in water, Bill would be excited because his office is right there. But uh, if we did. And then a section of the floor caved in, just dropped down, called a sinkhole. You know, anybody ever seen a sinkhole where the, like the roof of a cave just falls in? That happens all the time. There was a big one in Winter Park down near Orlando. If you ever get down there, Eric, uh, be sure to go to the place where the massive sinkhole was, uh, which is from Orlando, I think you go slightly north and mostly uh, west, Winter Park. A section of a neighborhood caved in and sank down about 40 feet, took several houses with it. Just dropped, uh, underwater, uh, underground cave collapsed. Sometimes this happens where these underground caves are full of water. So they help support, they don't, until everybody, people move in, and start drilling wells and pumping this water out. Now all of a sudden, crunch, everything falls down because <laughs> the roof of the cave won't support it anymore. Who cares? That's called a sinkhole. You can study that. It's called karst topography when you get into that in earth science class. So the water is actually assuage. They dropped down. Something happened to the crust of the earth to cause this water to run off in the flood. If you read Psalm 104, it tells us about this. It says, Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever. Thou coverest it with the deep, as with a garment. So this is obviously talking about the flood in the days of Noah. Psalm 104 is. Then it says, The waters stood above the mountains. And again, if the water is above the mountains, this is not a local flood. This is going to go on the other side of the mountains, obviously. So according to the Hovind theory, during the last few months of the flood, the unstable plates of the earth, which has now been fractured, here's the earth, the crust of the earth, all busted up like an eggshell. Some places are going to sink down, other places are going to lift up, like a waterbed. You push down one place, someplace else comes up. So these plates are going to shift. Thin spots sink down to become oceans. Thicker spots lift up to become mountains. It's real simple. The runoff 
of the water is going to cause huge erosion canyons in a hurry. The Bible says in Psalm 104, verse 7, At thy rebuke they fled. Now the they is referring back to the waters earlier in this verse. The waters fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They hurried away. If you have water that is hurrying away, you have erosion. Rapidly moving water can cut through a lot of things. Eric, go back here and grab, I hate to have you keep doing this, but I'm tied in with my cord here. The dinosaur made out of steel, you know, the closest one to me over here, bottom shelf. Yeah. Hand that to me if you would. A guy sent me this years ago made out of quarter-inch uh, plate steel. He said, Brother Hovind, I work in a welding shop and I made this for your museum. He's got his footy things on here. I looked at it. I said, man, how did you cut that so smooth? He said, oh, we cut it with water. Like 50,000 pounds per square inch or something, you know, but they, they, they squirt water on it real hard. And it cuts through the steel extremely smooth. Cut with water. It's not quite, yeah, it's probably 3 sixteenths. Uh, pretty, pretty thick. Probably, what, 20 pounds maybe. You wouldn't want to do that with a hexaw. No, hexaw would take a while, wouldn't it? So rapidly moving water can just do an awful, awful lot of damage. The other thing you get with rapidly moving water, it picks up a lot of debris. Pretty soon it starts, it's not just water anymore. Now it's a slurry of rocks, tree stumps, logs, boulders, and liquid sandpaper. So what they'll do when they drill a well, they will use drilling mud. Not just the drill bits drilling the well, the drilling mud is abrasive. They mix special mixture called drilling mud that they pump down, and they try to get just the right weight because you can add certain minerals to it and make your water heavier than if you had other minerals. So there's a real science to the drilling mud. You know, what, what are you going to put in this well? Because you've got to have just the right pressure to go down, eat the rock away, and push the debris up through the hole. Because you've got a drill bit, say, this big, and a pipe this big, which you're pumping water down through. So while they're drilling, this m drilling mud's going down and pushing everything up the outside. Because if you're drilling, the stuff's got to come up. And those are called the tailings. Who cares? Okay. Psalm 104, verse 8. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. Now this is an old English phrase, and many Bibles right here will have a reference note at the bottom to explain what this means. This is not the way we would say it today in modern 21st century English. Uh, they go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. The phrase that they have in the footnote at the bottom, the more modern way to say this is, the mountains rose, the valleys sank down. So what apparently is happening here in Psalm 104, verse 8, the mountains are actually lifting up and the valleys are actually sinking down. If we filled this room five feet deep in water, the whole building, and picked up that end of the building with the forklift, what would happen to the water? Go this way, right? Until it runs into something it can't move. Well, if you lift up a section of the earth as big as United States, and tilt it. You don't have to tilt it very far. Tilt it 100 feet in 2,000 miles. That's all it takes. Water's going to start running. Water seeks the lowest level, period. The there crust... Were the there were already some mountains and valleys. That, well, the Bible doesn't mention mountains. It mentions uh, hills, high hills. But then during the flood, it says the mountains were covered. So... A lot of people think most of the mountain ranges were formed during the flood because of numerous different factors. For one thing, if you had water under the crust of the earth that is jetting to the surface, once all this water shoots to the surface, it collapses. The rock collapses like a sinkhole, only a big one. But it's not going to sink evenly. It may sink and wrinkle up like a raisin. As, it, as sections as big as Texas collapse, it may collapse unevenly, causing rolling hills. All sorts of features can be formed in that one-year flood. If you're willing to understand what's going on, the water from underneath is coming to the surface, going to end up on top. 
Some of it's going to stay trapped and it's still there. Some of the water is going to be shooting sideways under this crust, between this basalt and crust of overlying rock. If it's leaving over here, from here it's shooting this way, causing earthquakes, just the water moving. <laughs> Lots of strange things can happen in this type of scenario. But it's very interesting. When they study the thickness of the Earth's crust, and of course they've never drilled through it. Nobody's ever drilled through the crust of the Earth. The deepest hole they ever drilled uh, was Project Moho. If you look on the far left over there, you can see Moho, M-O-H-O, -O, named after some guy named Moho Ravisic. I'd have picked somebody else to name it after, but uh, he said there has to be a place where the crust turns to liquid. It's hotter and hotter. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets. Eventually, you get deep enough, the rock is going to melt. At some point, it changes from solid to liquid. That point is called the Moho Ravisic discontinuity. Huh? Why does this say the continental crust is lighter than the ocean crust? It's I, thicker but lighter? It's 30 miles thick. It's a different type of rock or different density, is what this textbook says. Um, I had in California, no, where was I? Yes, in California, when I was teaching school, somebody brought me a piece of gorgeous rock. I said, what is this? And one side was polished real smooth. It was broken piece, but it was like yay big and, uh, and smooth, slick on one side and polished. Real. I'd never seen anything like it. Sort of like granite, only it had blues and other colors in it that I'd never seen in a rock before like that. And they said, oh, this kid said, my dad works for a company that goes out to the, in the Pacific Ocean. And they've got this big machine that blows the sediments away down to the solid rock. And then they cut out slabs of rock on the bottom of the ocean. And they bring it up and slab it up to make countertops. And super rich gazillionaires will make kitchen countertops so they can say, my countertop came from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Ha ha, where'd yours come from? Home Depot? <laughs> so, and they actually make rock out of the countertops and, and marble floors, you know, or you know, kitchen floors or whatever. Anyway, the kid gave me a broken piece of it that they had. It was just gorgeous. It, something is different about it. Oceanic crust is definitely different than continental crust. It's certainly thinner. The way they tell the thickness of the crust, you know, you can tap on something and kind of tell how thick it is by the sound it makes. Well, when earthquakes are happening, they send out a, a solid wave. Actually, if we had a steel rod across this room and I tapped on one end, if your head was up against the rod, you would feel it almost instantly, but you would hear it a second later. The sound wave gets there slower than the movement of the steel would. Same thing when you're banging on a railroad track. Down, get somebody a mile away, put your ear to it, they're a mile away, bang on the track, you hear it instantly through the rail. You hear it five seconds later through the air. Okay. By telling, by, by setting up a seismograph meters all over the world, they can tell where the earthquake was by judging, okay, it took 18 seconds to get to Tokyo, it took 14 seconds to get to Houston, it took 9 seconds to get to Seattle, and they ch -ch 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 happened right there. It really, it's really amazing how they do that, and they're, they're extremely accurate. Okay, that's not the question. What, what happens, though, is through the crust of the Earth, the sound wave travels a different speed than it does through the center of the Earth. They're called, uh, there's three different ones, S waves, P waves, and L waves, I think. It's been a long time since I studied that, but since I taught that. By judging, by, by, telling, by measuring these types of waves and how long the sound takes to get, let's say there's an earthquake in San Francisco, okay? How long does it take the S wave to get to Tokyo? And how long does it take the uh, P wave to get to Tokyo? Because the P wave, they assume, is going to go through the center or L, or one of the ways, goes through the liquid part. The other part travels around the crust. By putting together all these bits of data in very complex uh, formulas, they've decided they pretty much know the thickness of the crust of the Earth. And I think they're right. Continental crust is 30 to 20 to 30 miles thick. That would be a good quiz question. How thick is continental crust? Oceanic crust averages 3 to 5 miles thick. Knowing that oceanic crust is thinner, uh, they decided to try to drill down through the ocean floor to find the Moho Ravisic discontinuity. They were going to drill a hole in the ocean, which is tough to do. I mean, where do you park your drilling rig? Uh, <laughs> you got to park it on boats, which means they're going to go up and down with the tide. And they're going to move around. So 
It's a little tougher to park and drill a hole in the ocean floor, but they, they do that all the time. Anyway, they drilled down quite a ways, never could get through the solid part. And so it's only five miles. Well, you drill a hole five miles deep. 20 feet at a time, or whatever they do, 60 feet or 90 feet with their drilling rigs. So they never did. The project was called Project Moho. They spent buku bucks trying to drill a hole to find the Moho. Never did find it. Some uh, heathen in California started the rumor that the Russians had drilled a hole nine miles deep or something, you know, I forget what the number was, and they dropped a microphone down and could hear voices from hell. <laughs> he made up the whole story. And the Christians spread that around like crazy. I mean, the people, everybody's getting emails. Did you hear they heard voices from hell? <laughs> you know? oh, just to see how stupid Christians were, they spread this rumor all over the place, you know. That type of stuff circulates all the time. Oceanic crust is certainly thinner than continental crust. That's the point. Nobody argues with that. That might also indicate this had something to do with the flood. The Bible says the mountains lifted up, the valleys sank down. Well, where's going to be the weakest place? Three miles of rock or 30 miles of rock? Three miles. That's the place that's going to sink down. So maybe that's why they're the oceans. 30 miles thick under the continents, three to five miles under the oceans. Nobody argues with that that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and the earth is certainly broken up into plates. And almost all volcanic activity and earthquake activity is along these cracks. They're still moving. There's a ring around the Pacific Ocean, it's called the Ring of Fire, where there are many earthquakes and volcanoes right through Japan, right up here through South America, right up the coast of California, San Andreas Fault, right across Alaska. This is one of the major, they think the whole Pacific plate, uh, the, this whole plate is turning. And that's pretty obvious that it is turning because if you go visit some place where they put up a fence or a wall or port a highway, you know, you'll see the highway is <coughs> offset, or the fence is offset, or whatever, you know. There's all sorts of real direct evidence, yes, these plates are moving. Now the question is, how long has it been going on? The Christian who believes the Bible says, oh, this has been going on since the flood, 4,400 years ago. That's when this all started. And the plates are still moving, no big deal. Thin spots would sink down, thicker places would lift up in response which exaggerates the problem even worse. Now the water's going to run off faster. It may start off running, running off real slow, and then as the more weight gets over here, it accelerates, okay? And you get different types of erosion in the same area. So the mountains lifted up, the waters rushed off, and the erosion would be very rapid. I just flew over um, Idaho, coming from Spokane, Washington, to Salt Lake, and I was at the window uh, at the, in the airplane with a camera, videotaping, all sorts of things. It looks just like uh, somebody left the water running. Enormous erosion marks up there. When you guys flew from California, you've flown back here, haven't you? You've never flown? From Cal yeah. You drove one time, okay, you can't see it from the ground too well, but from the air you can really see this uh, erosion, water runoff. And you can just sit and stare out the window for hours thinking, man, there was a flood. All over the world there's evidence of this massive flood. This is a slick rock in Arizona. Gorgeous rock formations. Had to be formed very rapidly, I believe, because of this flood. So there's just lots of water erosion. Here's a Bryce Canyon with these little things sticking up all over the place, little piles of rock. Here's a picture of an ancient shoreline. A photo of evidence of millions of years of erosion near an ancient shoreline. I took this picture myself uh, September in the year 2000. You can see these pillars of rock sticking up just like Bryce Canyon. Millions of years of erosion. Oh, there's my sunglasses. This was a pile of dirt we had out here. Remember when we filled this hole in? It used to be the pond. It rained on it. After one rainstorm, it left behind a miniature version of Bryce Canyon. I said, Brian, I want you to ring the camera down here. I want you to picture, take a picture of the dirt. <laughs> Brian said, okay, Brother Hovind. <laughs> He said, he, uh, he said, for 10 minutes, I'm sitting, taking pictures of this dirt, thinking, why am I taking pictures of this dirt? Then he said, I saw what you did with it and put it together for Bryce Canyon and all this stuff. And he said, man, it's exactly the same. There's my ink pen sitting on top of some of these little piles of rock. 
You go drive out to any of the canyons out west, and you'll see these things sticking straight up called a butte. You know, you see John Wayne riding around in the, you know, in the movies in the west, and there's you know, the prairie, and then this whoosh, piled up and then flat on top. Mesa or butte. It depends how, how the bigger ones are called different names. Okay, there's a mesa, a butte, a tableland is one of them if they're real big. The flood did that. There's my moped parked next to the pile of dirt we took all these pictures on. Right out here, <laughs> 50 feet behind this building. You can get a pile of rock, sand, gravel, mud, mix it all together in a big pile. Take a hose, shh, sprinkle water on top. You can make just about every feature you find on earth in about 10 minutes. Make it in miniature form. Real rapidly. Millions of years of erosion along a highway built a few months ago. <laughs> uh, Mike was with me. Mike and I stopped. I think it was Mike. We stopped and took pictures of us standing by this erosion. They just finished the highway and didn't get the grass planted along the side in time. And it, it just made enormous erosion marks in, after one or two good rainstorms. Remember when we used to ride the motorcycles over in the clay pits up here past the railroad tracks? There was that road going out to uh, whatever that street is over here, just half a mile. Now it's a canyon 30 feet deep. And since we've been here, I showed you the pictures, didn't I, of in Georgia, Georgia's Little Grand Canyon? Yes, you did. That's incredible. They think what happened about 1810, 1820, some settler built a, 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 a lean-to or a shed, and there's no gutter on it. Water ran off and hit the edge and started a little erosion, a little gully. It's now a state park. Hundreds and hundreds of acres have been destroyed. This canyon just keeps growing and growing and growing. There are now nine canyons running into this one main channel. Probably all started by this farmer building his little hut. On, on just, it's a hilly area. And he's built up on top of the hill, and the water started cutting a channel. I've got all kinds of pictures of it. We're going to set up a display in here of that, uh, the Little Grand Canyon of, Air, of Georgia, south of Columbus, Georgia. I forget the name of the town now, but uh, just look on a map. Little Grand Canyon, it's on all the maps. So I think the erosion is best explained by the flood. Last week I was in Spokane, Washington. I did not get time to go over and see it, but I do have lots of pictures of Dry Falls, Washington. Go to Spokane and go west about... Um, 60 miles to the town of Cooley City, uh, between Cooley City and Moses Lake on Interstate 90. You will find Dry Falls, Washington. This is the largest waterfall in the world, and there's no water going over it. They said at one time it had more water going over it. They can tell by the erosion marks. There was more water going over that waterfall than all of the rivers in the world combined. Sounded like a flood. Apparently, there was probably an ice uh, dam blocking the huge lake or something. There was a massive lake that all drained over here at one time. I would say this probably happened toward the end of the flood or even a few years later, a few months later. As the ice is melting back, you would get enormous amounts of water. All of a sudden, it <laughs> gets released. Carved out this area in a hurry. Here's an Easter a washout, flood washout in eastern Montana. Um, so the water's going to, the rock is going to lift up, the water's going to rush off. One more thought here and we'll quit for the day. Most mountain ranges you see around the world follow the coastlines. You look at the Rocky Mountains, right here, parallel with the North Pacific. You look at the Andes Mountains in South America, right along the coastline of the South Pacific. Interesting. The Appalachian Mountains, you know, if you went to Tennessee Temple, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, part of the Appalachian Range, runs right up the east coast, parallel with the Atlantic Ocean. It's almost as if the mountain ranges and the oceans were formed because of the same thing and at the same time. If a section of the earth would lift up to make the Appalachians, someplace else is going to drop down, become part of the Atlantic Ocean. Off the coast of California is the Pacific Trench. You walk out... Here in Florida, you can walk out on the beach for a mile before it gets over your head. California, how far do you walk out before it's over your head? <laughs> about 40 feet, yeah. Go out about one mile and drop a string with a rock on it down, see how deep it is. Real deep. Go out about 10 miles and drop a string down. It's unreal. It's a lot deeper. There's a trench out there. Okay. 
Uh, who cares? Uh, all over the earth we find these bent, bent rock layers. You don't bend rocks very far. They break. But these rock, this one is in West Virginia. You can see the interstate highway was cut across here. This photograph taken showing this huge layers of rock are bent over interstate, whatever that is, going up through West Virginia. Well, they had to bend while they were soft, my humble opinion. If they were bent while they were hard, there would be cracks in the rock which do not exist. If I took 50 layers of clay and bent them and then baked it, no problem. It would hold that shape. But if I put 50 layers of clay and baked it and then bent it, it wouldn't bend. Well, if, if I could shatter it, but there'd be cracks, but they're not there. So all, here they are telling the kids, each of these layers is a different age. Well, then the bottom one's going to be hard before the next one gets on top. Bent rock layers are proof positive the layers were formed quickly and bent before any of them had time to harden. Is that an actual picture? That's an actual picture in uh, San Juan Capistrano, Capistrano, California. Where was that from you guys when you lived out there? San Juan Southern California. That's right. North is, I preached in Temecula, not too far from there. Okay. As the rock layers are bending, as the mountains are lifting up, this is going to exert pressure. Now, if you take limestone and squeeze it real hard, it changes to marble. Different types of stone. There are three types of stone or rock in the world, uh, not counting fossils. Okay. There is sedimentary rock, which is sediment that settled out. There is metamorphic rock. Metamorphic means it's been changed by heat and pressure. You get pressure and heat, it'll change it to something else. Marble used for tombstones and... Is that know. like real dense rock then? Because of the heat it changes the, changes the structure of the molecules. They line up differently. Then you have igneous rock. Igneous comes from a Latin word ignite. What kind of rock would be igneous? Volcanic rock, lava, stuff like that igneous rock. Those are the three basic categories of rocks. Sedimentary, igneous, and metamorphic. Where are you most likely to find fossils? Sedimentary. You wouldn't find it in igneous rock. If there was anything in there, it got melted and recycled. Okay. So, after the flood, I believe the oceans were smaller than they are today. Continents were bigger, which means you could walk anywhere in the world. We'll get into that next week. What happened after the flood? Why do we have a continental shelf? Kind of interesting. Um, how did they get to Australia? We'll cover that next week, all that stuff on the... Uh, what was it like after the flood and continue with the Hoven theory and get into about Mount St. Helens and what it did in Washington State showing uh, what a, one catastrophe can do in a hurry. Right? See you next week. Thank you.